welcome to the second IABC panel discussion of the year, Career Insights Medical Professionals Part 1. My name is Ala. And my name is Sarah. And we will be your moderators for today. Today we welcome guest panelists from the, our IABC community who are medical professionals and parents of students here at the IA. Thank you for being here. We'll start off by having each one of you guys introduce themselves. Mr. Cyril Davis, could you please begin and tell us a little bit about yourself and your career? Is it working? Oh, there you go. Uh, so, hey, thank you guys for inviting me out. My name is Cyril Davis. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, my previous career before this, I worked in law enforcement for 15 years. Uh, had an event happen um, and switched over to the healthcare field working as a nurse. I started out as a nurse in the ER, uh, did round one and two of COVID. And I now work as a manager at a depression clinic in West Bloomfield. And I'm currently at grad school at Wayne State. Thank you. Dr. Asra Hamzabi, could you please go next? So thank you guys for having us. Um, I am an adult psychiatrist, and Mr. Okma was my teacher. Um, and so I, I, I'm really, really happy to be here because this kind of goes in full circle. Um, I have my own private practice. It was in Bloomfield Hills physically. Now we're only remote. But um, like I said, I'm a product of Bloomfield Hills schools, and I went to University of Michigan for undergrad, um, decided I wasn't going to be a doctor, then changed my mind and went back to it. Um, so I did a master's in between. Um, at Wayne State, and then I went to Michigan State for medical school, and then Henry Ford for residency. Um, we moved with, uh, you know, my two or one and then two kids uh, to Chicago for my husband's job. Took four and a half years off, and then came back and did residency. Finished my residency in Michigan. So I have not had a straight linear path, um, and I can share more about that. Thank you so much. Dr. Lara Kotari, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself and your career? Hi, everyone. It's on? Okay, yeah. Uh, so I'm Dr. Lara Kotari. I am a pediatrician. I graduated uh, with a degree in engineering, biomedical engineering from Duke University, and then went to medical school at the University of Michigan. I did my residency training at the University of Maryland and stayed on as chief resident. And then afterwards, I worked at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School uh, as a pediatric hospitalist. Uh, a hospitalist is a specialist who takes care of patients that are in the hospital during the time that they're in the hospital. And so I take care, took care of a lot of um, hosp hospitalized ill uh, children and um, also had a role in uh, medical education at Harvard Medical School. And then I moved to Michigan in 2013 to uh, join the Children's Hospital of Michigan and Wayne State University Medical School, where I was an associate program director for the residency program, as well as a pediatric hospitalist there as well, and the director of simulation. Um, so I've had a lot of roles. Um, I've since left the Children's Hospital of Michigan and um, to pursue other interests. And um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Dr. Anna Groby, could you please tell us about yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Anna Groby. I am a general pediatrician in the community. I have an office in Birmingham. So uh, I went to the University of Michigan for undergrad. I received a degree in biology. I've always loved science. And after that, I did go to Michigan State for medical school and trained in Detroit at the Children's Hospital of Michigan. Um, I'm a general pediatrician, which means much like you guys have your whole life gone to the doctors and gotten checkups, or when you're sick, you go to the doctor, you get vaccines. So that's basically what I do. I've um, been a pediatrician since 2009. Up next, we have Dr. Shashin Doshi. 
Thank you uh, for having us. Um, my name is Shashim Doshi. I've got uh, two wonderful kids here at uh, International Academy, so I just want to say hi to them real quick and embarrass them for the moment. Uh, Serena and Sajin, nice to, nice to be here. Um, you know, everyone has a different path to get to, to get to where they are. Mine was an incredibly direct path. Um, uh, you know, differs from some of my colleagues here. Um, and there's no right or wrong. I knew from a very early age that I wanted to go into medicine. Um, and so as soon as I finished uh, high school, I went into a direct med program. Um, and I was lucky to get into one out in California. Uh, so I was at UCLA, I did an undergrad and uh, at med school out there. And as soon as I finished, um, I had started a uh, radiology residency program in Chicago at Northwestern. Um, finished there in 2006, did a fellowship there as well uh, until 2007 in uh, orthopedic uh, radiology. If you don't know what a radiologist is, uh, we'll have some time to talk about it, but uh, don't worry. I think when I was in high school, I didn't know what a radiologist did either. So, um, but if you like a blend of medicine, anatomy, technology, um, I can't think of a better field. So I'm very, uh, I'm very lucky that, uh, to be in it, and I'm very proud to be uh, a radiologist. And last but not least, we will have Ms. Melissa Langness uh, tell us about herself. Thank you very much. I'm super excited to be here as well. Um, I have an 11th grader, Dane. Um, and they've given me a microphone, so now you got a listening to them. Um, so I, I also, like uh, Mr. Davis, did not have a direct uh, career path into nursing. Um, I actually was a very good high school student. I got very good grades. Um, so it was kind of one of those things where I was like, okay, of all these things that I like to do, what am I going to do for a living? And um, one of the things I love to do was speak Spanish. So I ended up just getting a double major in Spanish because that was easy. Um, I went to Western Michigan University, and my other major was in human resource management. Um, and I decided after a few years that human resource management was not all the fun and excitement I thought it was going to be. And um, when I was pregnant with my oldest son, about six weeks before he was born, I got laid off. And I was like, you know what? This is a great time for me to reevaluate what I want to do for the rest of my life. And um, there's something about becoming a parent that I think gives you more confidence, sometimes less confidence, but more confidence. Um, and I thought, you know what? I wanted to be a nurse way back then. Why didn't I just go ahead and do it? So I talked to some friends of mine who were nurses, and uh, they led me to go to Oakland Community College um, because, believe it or not, you can actually get an RN license from a community college. You don't have to go to a four-year school. So um, with two bachelor's degrees and a master's degree um, under my belt, I actually make my money with an associate degree. So community colleges are great options um, for people too. Um, so I have worked in a lot of different areas in nursing. Um, I started out in cardiology. I've worked in cardiology cath lab. I've worked in intensive care. Um, I've done case management. And my current position is that I am the um, supervisor for employee health and safety at Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital. So I make sure all the people who work for us um, are safe while they are at work. And that involves a lot of different things. So i um, be glad to answer more questions about that. But thank you. So to start with the questions, could each of you talk a little bit about how you knew you wanted to work in the medical field? So I think um, the, the truth of it is that both my parents were doctors, <laughs> and my dad made it really simple. He said, all three of you guys have to be doctors. Now, fortunately, very fortunately for him, um, all three of us, I have two older brothers and they're dermatologists, and my dad was a dermatologist. So um, fortunately for him, we actually you know, all love what we do, um, and we were geared that way. Um, but I think it's, it's also you know, kind of this idea of knowing if you like to help people. So I knew that I, I like to help people, and I remember in seventh grade learning what a therapist, or not, a, I think we just knew what a psychologist was, and um, I was kind of that kid that everyone would come to with their problems, and I didn't know that that was just even a thing. And then I realized, oh, that's a 
that's an actual career, and then I realized, oh, I have to be a doctor, so I guess I'm not going to be a psychologist, I'm going to be a psychiatrist. So, um, and I did love the sciences, I, I really did. So it was, it was a very natural, in that sense, from that point, it was a very natural kind of path for me. And, um, you know, I, I have to say that I would have probably taken a, a very, very winding road for different reasons if, if he hadn't kind of narrowed it down for me. So I, it did work out in this case. Um, you know, because I said I had a very uh, direct path and uh, I, I knew from an early age what I wanted to do, um, I can share what, what brought me into medicine or what, uh, what motivated me to go into medicine. And that was, I was inspired by actually an aunt and a cousin who were, uh, there was, um, it was my aunt and her daughter were both uh, physicians and um, I loved what they did. I loved who they were. I loved the type of people they were. And, and to be honest with you, I was inspired by, um, by what they were doing uh, and by the type of people they were. So uh, it was from a very early age that I was um, motivated or inspired to go into medicine by them. So I can share. Um, I, uh, in high school, did not want to be a doctor. I also came from a family of physicians, not my parents, but my aunts and uncles were all physicians, and so they all said, you should be a doctor, and I said, no, I don't want to be a doctor. Uh, so I love science and math, so I decided engineering was the way to go, and biomedical engineering, um, technology that relates to the body, how amazing is that? I was going to design prosthetic limbs, that's what I wanted to do. And as I completed my engineering um, curriculum, I decided to um, work in the lab and see what engineering was about. And I realized that I actually wanted more human interaction in my day. And so I did end up deciding to go to medical school. It was a year after I graduated, so I had to go back and take organic chemistry, I wasn't planning on it, so I did have to backtrack and take the prereqs, um, and ultimately ended up at the University of Michigan for medical school. So that was not my original plan, and your seat, you know, where you are today, I was going to be an engineer, that's what I was going to do, but um, I'm thrilled that I actually ended up in medicine, and um, have been able to do um, a variety of different things, and, um, and help people, and teach people. So, um, actually I wanted to be a doctor uh, when I was at your age. I went to Crockett Technical High School down in Detroit, right around the corner from Children's. But at that time, nobody in my family uh, had ever went to college. I actually became the first graduate from college when I graduated with my nursing degree. So. Uh, not have the resources or the where of uh, how to become a doctor. Um, I chose a different path and went into law enforcement. But after I got hurt, um, I thought about the nurses and doctors and the healthcare professionals, professionals who helped me along the way. So I couldn't no longer be a protector in that way. And a huge thing of nursing is always advocacy for your patients, always above all. So. That's what pushed me into nursing, and um, I, I absolutely love what I do. Uh, it makes a huge impact to be able to help people uh, when they need most. So that was my way to the field. Um, much like Dr. Joshi here, I always did know I wanted to be a doctor. Um, I wanted to help people. I love kids. I think babies are adorable. Um, and I knew I never could be a teacher, so hats off to the teachers in the room. I could never do your job. Um, I think science is a little bit like magic that we can control, so I felt like that was the best fit. Um, I like science. I love math. Um, I love being able to help people. I love being able to help keep people healthy. I think even small interactions with other humans in the world is important. So 
you know, being a pediatrician lets me do that every day. I get to interact with parents and little kids, and my job is fun. And that's sort of like the goal in life is to do something that makes a difference, even on a small scale, um, to make the world a better place. Um, I think we are seeing a very common theme. We have a lot of people who are wanting to be helpers, right? Um, and that was my motivation, too. Um, there's something about being able to connect with people when they are at their most vulnerable. Um, there is something about when you work in a healthcare profession that you can actually touch somebody, not only physically, but mentally, spiritually. You can make a huge difference for people um, just by listening. And I think you guys are at a really unique um, part in your life where I think a lot of you understand that. You know, it's, it's so important to be empathetic and to be good listeners and to um, you know, be able to help other people. And I'm being upstaged by a dumpster out there, which is great. Um, <laughs> but um, no, but really, just being able to be there for people. Um, I love telling people that I'm a nurse. My parents love telling people that I'm a nurse. It really, it's it's just a job where you can actually you you can physically interact with people. You can you can spiritually interact with people and really make a difference for them um, when they're at their most vulnerable and at some of the worst times in their life and at some of the best times of their life too. So. Okay. So next up, we'd like to ask the panelists: How long has it taken you to become? Um, I think we'll start with Mr. Cyril Davis. So how long has it uh, taken you to become a practicing registered nurse? And what was that process for you? Uh, so I went to OCC uh, for my associates. Um, OCC is one of the top ranked nursing schools in the state. So I know a lot of people. And I felt the same way. Like, I don't want to go to a community college. Um, but I went to OCC, got my associate's degree. That way I was able to start working as a nurse immediately. I uh, went to Chamberlain to get my bachelor's. I was able to do that in eight months. And uh, now I'm currently at Wayne State's in their doctorate program, uh, where hopefully 2025 I graduate uh, with my uh, doctorate in nurse practitioner. So I took a really, really, really long time. Um, and so, you know, out of Lasser High School, so it's BHHS now, but it was Lasser High School at the time, um, and I graduated in 1992, and then uh, went on to University of Michigan, and I was a biopsych major, um, and, you know, I really did like that, but I gotta tell you, my Lasser High School education was better than my University of Michigan education, I dare say. Um, and, um, but I did like like being at Michigan and then went on as I kind of tried to figure out if I was going to go instead of medicine, if I was going into dental or physical therapy because I started getting some exposure to those areas, um, I decided to do a master's in biology. Um, and part of that was because I just copied what my middle, my older brother did. Um, uh, while I was there, I realized, you know, the neuro, I, I, had, I think I had a professor who, um, it was like a neuroscience professor. Um, and he was fantastic. So it just really right, you know, brought me right back to, you know, I love neurotransmitters and other things like that. So went on to, um, you know, complete my master's at Wayne and then, and then did um, my uh, uh, medical school at Michigan State. And, and that was because my husband was there. So I mean, a lot of this was kind of driven by, you know, life outside of my career goals, but, um, but it, I, I have no regrets in any of it. Now, after I completed medical school, you know, we uh, moved to Chicago for my husband's job, and uh, I was expecting a son, Fowler, he's my son, and he's a senior, um, and so he was, uh, I already had my older one, I had my son on the way, I decided there's no way I can do residency without any support or any help, so I stayed home, and I thought it was going to be for a year, and it ended up being for four and a half years, um, and that was, you know, by choice. So I realized I, if we don't have support, I don't want to leave my, my kids with just anybody. Um, and it was a very risky thing to do. I was told time and again, um, you know, that you're not going to be able to get back into medicine. And I said, okay, well, that's a possible, you know, that's, that's possible. At the same time, what I know for a fact is that my kids need me now. 
So I took that chance and, and I stayed home. And then I went on, I applied to programs. I got to Northwestern and got into University of Chicago, um, uh, University of Illinois. So nobody stopped me. Um, they did ask me, you know, what was I doing with my time? And I was like, well, you guys are, I didn't say this, of course, but I said, you guys are psychiatrists. So, you know, the formative years of, of life are these initial stages, and that's where, you know, babies learn about the safety or the lack of safety in the world, and I kind of went the whole psych way, and I meant it, um, and I was very proud of my decision. So I really think that that confidence in my, my decision, which was very, very atypical, um, got me all those spots. So, um, you know, once I completed, um, you know, at that time with, with, you know, kind of staying home with my kids, I said, okay, I, I do feel like they're ready, and, and we ended up actually moving back. My husband stayed back for a little while in Chicago, came back, moved in with my parents, so I had tons of support, and, um, you know, had uh, basically a, a three and a five-year-old, and I went back to residency. Um, in my third year of residency at Henry Ford, I, you know, we were planning on having a third child. We found out that there were twins. So, um, you know, my program director, after I like picked her up off the ground because she thought I was going to quit, um, you know, I, I said, well, you know, I'm going to keep going after I take my, I took 15 weeks and then went back to work, um, and went on to do kind of part-time um, outpatient psychiatry from there. So, very, you know, winding road, but I kind of did it my way. As I mentioned in undergrad, I wanted to do um, biomedical engineering, and um, forgot to mention it's because I used to watch the show Bionic Man and Bionic Woman, which I may be dating myself because none of you know what that is. But <laughs> I see hands up. What a great show! And I said, well, "This is amazing. This really could be." But um, so just to understand, then I did medical school and residency, and we've talked a lot about what residency is. Um, but I'm not sure maybe everyone understands what that is. And so medical school in general is about college in general, if you're doing a bachelor degree or your program is generally four years. I'll explain what I did. And then um, medical school is four years. Um, and then after that, you choose a specialty. And a specialty could be pediatrics, internal medicine, family medicine, psychiatry, surgery, et cetera. Um, so you've heard these words, and you do different things in each of those fields. But the training period to make you a practicing pediatrician um, is different based on the specialty. So pediatrics is three years, internal medicine is three years, general surgery is five years, nurse surgery is seven. So that's training beyond medical school. And there you do practice. You are a physician because you graduated medical school. But um, you do take care of patients, but you're supervised. You're supervised by professionals in that field, and um, you get trained to do that specialty. So beyond that, you could do a fellowship even uh, beyond that specialty, uh, which will be additional years, depending on that fellowship. So just to give you a sense, from start to finish, after you graduate high school, if you do the four-year bachelor program, it's four years plus four, plus perhaps three, so, um, so just so you know that it's a little 12 years by the time you're, or 11 years by the time you're done to be a practicing pediatrician. So I think Dr. Carney summed it up, right? I did four years at U of M, I did four years at Michigan State, and then three years um, at Children's Hospital of Michigan, plus what's called a chief residency year, basically you're in charge of the other residents. You build their schedule and you boss them around. And then you get a job. Um, yeah, mine was uh, pretty direct, uh, as direct as you can be for radiology. Um, I did uh, a seven-year um, undergrad and med program together. Um, so that was seven. And then internship, residency, and fellowship, which are just different terms, uh, different stages of training uh, after medical school, but that was uh, a total of six years, so 13 years uh, for, for me to end up being a radiologist. Well, even when you 
go the community college route, it does take about two years to get your prerequisites done, and then it's about 18 months to two years to get your actual nursing classes done. So um, if you're starting from the ground up and you don't have any college credits under your belt, then you're looking at probably about four years for a community college or even for um, a bachelor's degree um, program for nursing. Um, you can either be an associate prepared or a bachelor's prepared um, candidate to take the NCLEX exam, which is what um, you take to become a registered nurse in the state of Michigan. Well, it's a national exam. Um, but uh, so essentially, for me, it only took about three years because I already had a lot of prerequisites out of the way with my other degrees. Um, but uh, about four years is probably pretty average um, to become an RN. There are lots of things you can do beyond that. Um, you know, get a master's degree, get a doctorate, um, things like that. So there are lots of um, additional steps, but to become a basic nurse, registered nurse, to uh, provide direct patient care, you can get that done in four years and probably about $12,000 if that uh, is something you're thinking about. <laughs> So now, could you talk about what an average day looks like for you guys? Uh, so an average day for me now, uh, being a manager at a depression, outpatient depression clinic, is just making sure everything is up and running. And all, where all my nursing and nursing assistants are where they're supposed to be. And, giving a quality care to our patients. Uh, so it's amazing, it's great, it's excellent. Uh, but prior to this, when I was an ER nurse um, at Troy Beaumont, it was, it was fun, I love it. You never knew what you was gonna get. Every day was different, um, good and bad. But uh, I've seen everything from gunshot wounds to heart attacks or you name it. But to be able to work with as a team, as a unit, to help people, uh, it's, a, it's amazing. So, I, so it's so many different things you could do in nursing, but uh, those are the two that I worked with. So at every stage of, of uh, this training is different, but now I have my own practice. Um, and so my day begins, you know, at 6.30, 6.45 dragging three to four kids out of bed. Um, although my son's the one who gets himself up. Um, so so that's, that's where it begins, and then it's you know making lunches and dropping kids off at school who don't already drive. Uh, and then it's meetings. Um, so because I run a practice, and so basically I'm you know, running a business now instead of just being a doctor, um, I have a lot of meetings. Um, whether it's you know, with the electronic health record people or the um, you know, building people. So that all, you know, takes place after my kids are at school. And then I start seeing patients, you know, anywhere from, you know, 9.30 to 10.30, depending on that morning. Um, and I'm seeing patients, you know, if it's a new patient, I'm spending an hour to an hour, I'm spending an hour and a half uh, with a new patient. And then if it's a follow-up patient, I'm spending 30 minutes. Um, and I'm working until it's time to pick up the kids from school. Um, and then it's, you know, getting them ready, getting them fed and, doing homework and getting ready for the next day. Um, and then I often, you know, volunteer in the community or I'm, I, you know, uh, assisting with um, other things. So it's, it's, it's I, it definitely, my job is not just being a psychiatrist or a doctor. Um, there's so much more to it. I think we all have lives, you know, outside of our fields. And I think we're gonna get to this idea of work-life balance. I chose psychiatry because I saw not only that I had an interest in it, but that it could give me the work-life balance that I was very much looking for. So in my roles as a pediatric hospitalist and um, an associate program director and educator, uh, my day would start with rounding with a team of medical students and residents on the patients that were admitted to the hospital, sometimes 15 to 25 patients, um, and spend the morning seeing those patients, discussing plans, 
uh, and then teaching the residents and students about whatever disease um, or illness there might be. And then I might do um, a, a teaching session at 12 or where uh, I was the director of simulation, so I would run simulations, which is where you use high fidelity simulators, which are basically big robots, to simulate actual patients. Um, these simulators could blink, sweat, and have all of the actual physical sounds of heart beating and lungs breathing, etc. So you could practice your clinical skills on them. And so I used to run simulations with the residents and students routinely, um, or teach them about something else. And then in the afternoon they have meetings, for the administrative roles as well. So that's what my typical day would be. So I see uh, patients from birth until age 21. So the patients make usually an appointment scheduled ahead of time, especially for well visits. Those scheduled are, are planned well in advance. Um, and then we have what's called same-day sick appointments, which is you don't feel good that morning, so you go to the doctor to make sure you don't have, say, strep throat or some illness like that. So I see patients anywhere from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. at night, depending on the day of the week. Um, and those patients sort of just keep coming. Um, I also uh, am a practice owner, which also means there's a lot of not so fun meetings and administration and dealing with sort of running the office. So there's a lot of admin that also has to happen. Um, I feel very lucky. I don't have to sit in a lot of meetings, so uh, so I am thankful for that. Um, what does a radiologist do? I read images. I read studies. Um, so if you've ever injured yourself, gone in the emergency room, uh, if you had an x-ray, ultrasound, CAT scan, MRI, uh, those images come. I don't take those images, but those images come to us, and uh, and we read them. Um, and so that's, that's pretty much what my day is filled with. The more, uh, the busier the emergency room, the busier I am. Um, and I, uh, I go through, I can, you know, we can run through a lot of cases um, uh, in a shift. My shifts can be eight hours to ten hours long. Um, occasionally I'm working with residents and fellows, so there is simultaneous uh, helping the patients, so doing the clinical work and, uh, and teaching going on. Um, in my off hours uh, for, for the hospital, uh, I'm, I'm involved in research, um, so there's always uh, research projects with I, I do mine with orthopedics, but uh, you know everyone can do it with whatever subspecialty they're associated with. Um, and residents, fellows, medical students also work with us um, on those uh, on those research projects. Uh, and lately, um, this didn't happen for us until COVID, but this refers sort of back to work-life balance. But um, you know, radiology is very technology-driven, um, so I don't actually even have to be in the hospital to get these images. I mean, images can be. They're not emailed to us per se, but they, they just pop up on a, on a system and I can read them from anywhere. Um, and we didn't really take advantage of that opportunity until, uh, until COVID hit. And so, um, you know, not a lot of great things came out of COVID, but that was one, uh, silver lining. Uh, and I think, my, uh, I think my kids think I'm at home way too much because about 60% uh, of my shifts are from home. Uh, they'd probably like to see me out of the house uh, uh, a lot more than I am. Um, but anyways, that's what I do. I, I read a lot of cases, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, from birth to uh, you know to geriatric patients to uh, unfortunately end of life, um, we we read full uh, full gamut of ages, um, both genders or all genders, um, and uh, and primarily injuries from the emergency room, but really all kinds of cases that present. Um, once you are in a management level, you do attend a lot of meetings um, and run a lot of meetings, so I will not bore you with the details of uh, running meetings, um, but uh, some of the different committees that I um, work with are um, primarily around safety um, within the hospital, uh, workplace violence within the hospital, um, and things like that. Uh, but. There are days when I get to step out of my role as a supervisor and um, step back into nursing shoes, which I do love to wear. 
Um, I also love to wear scrubs, so that is definitely a plus if you're looking for a medical career because you get to wear like your pajamas to work basically um, if you work in a hospital. <laughs> um, but uh, when I work as a nurse within the clinic, um, I'm there to answer lots of questions that people may have in regard to the vaccines they're receiving, um, in regard to the tests that we're running for new hires and things like that. Um, I, I do a lot of, of uh, questions. People have a lot of questions in regard to, um, you know, with, with the world of COVID, um, a lot of the questions that we receive are regarding, um, do I have COVID? Do you think I have COVID? Um, so that uh, is a word I wish would go away forever. <laughs> but uh, but we, are, we are where we are. Um, so, but a traditional, if you're a, if you're a bedside nurse, the really cool thing is you get to collaborate with a lot of different um, specialties. Um, so not only all the different physicians that might be assigned to a patient, but also things like speech therapy and um, physical therapy. And I think there are plans later for us to have some additional um, meetings like this where you guys will get to hear from people from different um, specialties within the healthcare um, community. But um, so. Typically, though, when you're a nurse that's doing direct patient care, you work with a lot of different specialties to ensure that your patients are well cared for. Um, you have meetings with families uh, to ensure that their questions are being answered um, and, uh, and that all their concerns are being met as well. Because when you're caring for patients, you're not just caring for the person who's laying in the bed or sitting in your clinic, but you're often caring for their family members um, as well because there's a lot going on with all those dynamics with those individuals too. So. A whole whole gamut of, of everything. <laughs> Thank you guys. Uh, next we're going to be taking live questions from the audience. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and Declan will come around so you guys can ask you guys can ask general questions or make them more specific. Um so I guess that's what we're on this side of the room, make your way that way. So we'll go. Right here, go ahead and stand up for me. During things like residency, do you get paid or not? Uh, during things like residency, do you get paid? So you do get paid when you're a resident. The hospital is given generally money actually from the federal government. That's usually how it works, and then the hospital pays you. Um, residency salaries are pretty uniform across the board. Most residents are required to work up to 80 hours a week. So if you broke it down per hour, you're making less than minimum wage. Um, but it's about 35 to 45 thousand dollars, depending on the place you are in the United States. One more thing on the work hours. Um, so the 80 hour work week just got implemented, I wanna say 10, 15 years ago. Prior to that, when we were in training, there was no work hour limit. And so routinely you would work more than that um, and do 36 hour shifts every fourth night or I did one Q3 month, which was every third night where you're either on call or post call and then one day in between where you're working still eight to ten hours probably ten hours that day um, and then they realized that um, safety was of a concern and education wasn't happening as well as it could be uh, because there were sleepless residents so they've now limited the work hours to 80 hours a week which is still a significant amount I was just curious during your journey to get where you are today, what would you say was the hardest part of it? Um, I can say uh, for at least where, you know, I, I ended up becoming a physician uh, and going into radiology. Honestly, the toughest thing is it's just super competitive. Um, uh, as you know, I mean, I'm, I'm looking out at a room full of really bright kids here. Um, all of you are qualified uh, to go into medicine, no doubt, and you guys will be qualified. But then there's like thousands and thousands of more kids just like you applying for the same for the same couple hundred spots everywhere. So um, it's just very competitive. But don't don't let that don't let that deter you. If you're interested, 
follow your dream. That's okay. I mean, it's everything's competitive now. Law school, you know, I was just talking to Declan. He wants to go to law school. That's going to be competitive. You know, you want to go to business. You want to you want to do an MBA. That's going to be competitive. Everything is competitive. So don't let it deter you. But yeah, I mean, if uh, you know, I don't, I don't know about if you if you're asking about a tangible thing, what was the most difficult thing? But I think just overall, you know, just the idea of how competitive it is. It, uh, you know, going into medicine, I think that's probably the biggest, uh, the biggest challenge. Or, I don't. Uh, to your question, uh, keep a keep your eye on the prize, but enjoy the journey. Would be my thing. Uh, one of our our sons just went off to college, and he already thinking about making it into. Uh, to become a doctor, and he just started his first semester. You have to enjoy the journey. It's going to be ups and downs. Um, you get a group of students that's with you that think like you and, and pushing for that same goal. Uh, that will keep you focused. So don't just, I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to be a nurse. Enjoy that journey, be involved, get involved in um, different groups. I did a lot of volunteering when I was at OCC in my undergrad, and I do it at, at Wayne. Um, with different events, so that kind of keep that fire going outside of the study part, the school part of um, you and your career. I think hands down the hardest thing was having uh, giving birth during residency. So um, the, the, the actual and, and then just the life around it. So you know, twins that didn't help anything, but. Um, but, you know, <laughs> at the same time, I think the, the kind of the rate limiting step in that whole process is, is, you know, how am I doing? You know, am I okay? Can I do this? Can I do this next thing? Um, and, you know, I, I think this is the part that with, with the mental health state of our world and, um, you know, certainly our country right now, it's never been more important to take your own pulse and say, is this what I should be doing for myself first? So um, I think there's certainly stages in medicine where you are pushed to your absolute limit. And I think that the culture of medicine is starting to shift, like beginning with that very merciful, you know, drop to 80 hours a week. Um, you know, that it's starting to shift towards recognizing these are human beings and not robots. Um, and because, also because there's so many women in medicine, you know, it's 50% of the, you know, the, of doctors at least are, 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 um, are female. So, um, you know, our women and, and many of those are having children. So it's completely impractical and unsustainable to, for the healthcare industry to be able to function without accommodating that. And that knowledge to me kind of said, okay, that means that I'm going to, you know, they're going to tell me I can only have eight weeks off after having... Um, twins, I was like, well, don't I get like a couple of more weeks for like having two? Nope, nope, you get the same amount as everyone. So that was, that was eye-opening, but um, I, I still don't regret it. You know, I think what you learn is what you're capable of. And I think the idea that you guys have made it this far, um, you've gone through a pandemic, um, you've gone through, you know, being in just a constant state of uncertainty, I feel like you're prepared for anything because you're already bright, you're already here, you're hardworking. Um, you're a, a group of kids who actually helps each other and doesn't cut each other down um, and, or harm each other. So just that environment by itself means that you guys are so much ahead of the game. So just to tie up with that, um, uh, just remember to fill your own buckets so that you can fill other people's buckets, right? In whatever you choose to do. And we are health professionals, so we choose to care for other people's health. But um, but that's important in whatever you choose to do. Declan, question? Um, I just want to say thank you for doing this panel today. It's really amazing for all of you to come out here and talk to all of us today. It's such an honor. Um, my question is, um, for those of you, many of you have kind of balanced between a medical field, but also have delved into so many things almost, I don't want to say accidentally, but as a consequence through either owning a business or um, just managing other people or working with other people, how do you find 
kind of that balance from kind of what you went in first to kind of reshaping now, I guess, in your work and life? So some things are intentional and some things are accidental. Um, you know, knowing where you want to go isn't always where you end up. Um, sometimes you just have to kind of go with the flow. So it's very easy to say like, okay, I want to be a doctor. And then which kind of doctor? Okay, I'm going to be this kind of doctor. And then, you know, I want to open my own business. I want to be in control of my schedule. I want to, you know, control the economics around that versus I'm happy to be employed by another doctor or I'm happy to be employed by a hospital system or a different group of, of doctors. So sometimes it's intentional and sometimes it's not. And really, this applies to everything in life. You just have to be flexible. You have to sort of know your limits and you have to push your limits and you have to do everything you think you're capable of. You're always capable of more. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. And offices open and offices close and, and COVID happened, which nobody expected, at least no one here in this panel, I'm sure. So some, you, you just really have to be flexible. And like everyone has sort of emphasized, the path is not always straight. The road is not always north to south. It just isn't. And so being able to sort of say, OK, well, this was a challenge, or this was a curve, or this was a left turn I didn't expect to take, you just sort of have to go with it. And if you have the the um, ability, if you have the drive to do other things like open a practice or close a practice or you know extra time in the community, you know then that's what we would encourage all of you to do. So use all of your talents that, that you have cultivated and use all of your knowledge to your full potential. I was wondering, going into your field, if there's like anything that you had to learn or figure out that you didn't expect. Like, for example, going into a medical field, was there anything that you were just like, why would I need to know this, or I didn't really expect to have to learn and grow from this going into it? Um, the majority of things that you cover in science class, you'll be questioning all the time, why do I need to know this? Um, because uh, it seems so esoteric, um, and it seems incredibly complicated, and you say, well, how does this translate to helping a patient uh, later, whether it's in nursing, whether it's as a physician, in uh, anywhere in healthcare. And the truth of the matter is, it all builds upon itself. So you have to understand the, the building blocks, the fundamentals of everything, and that's where it gets really broken down in these science classes, in your science books. Um, so pay attention when, you're, when, you're, when your teachers are teaching. Pay attention because all of that stuff matters. Uh, it builds upon itself. Um, now when I go back and you know, my kids are looking at uh, bio and I'm looking at phospholipids and uh, things like that, it, you know, it's, it's way back in some dark corner of my brain. But, uh, um, but it all did build upon one another because, you know, you learn about cell function and, and organelles and that's how you learn how cancer attacks a cell or how um, a, a vaccine protects a cell or, you know, whatever the case. So it does all build upon itself. But you'll question that many times. Why am I learning any of this? Um, and, uh, and I still wonder that about calculus. No offense to all of that. Math features here. But uh, that's just because whatever I went into, it doesn't apply to what I do, but for many people it does. So uh, pay attention to everything, uh, and then you'll go down your path. All right, everyone, we would like to thank all of our panelists for coming in today. We appreciate it so much, and speaking on behalf of everyone here, it was a pleasure to learn from you and to gain knowledge about your experiences. 
We would also like to thank Mr. Techmeyer, the IABC board, Dr. Katari, Ms. Vicki Chandler for everything they have done to make this event possible. Special shout out to Dr. Katari. She really pulled all of this panel together. We could have done a lot of that. So thank you so much, Dr. Katari. Also, some of our IABC members will be throwing some brain stress balls out into the crowd, courtesy of Mr. Harris there. So 